The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communication at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Files Channel 1962. It is also being live streamed at boston.gov slash cable. This is the EDIC July EDIC board meeting, which is being held virtually to ensure the safety of the public, staff, staff members, and the BPDA board members during the COVID-19 situation. I will now take roll call for, take roll call. Uh, Ms. Down. Present. Mr. Monaghan. Present. Dr. Landmark. Present. Mr. Miller. Present. And I have two robust uh, and present as well. Okay, so the first item on the agenda. Request authorization for the approval of the minutes of the June 11, 2020 meeting. Uh, motion is in order. So moved. Second. All those in favor? Oh, you're gonna do a roll call for a vote. <laughs> uh, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay, and the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number two, request authorization to amend the existing agreement with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center to receive funding for stakeholder engagement as a part of the ongoing participation in the community microgrid program in an amount not to exceed $5,300 and to enter into an agreement with Burr Energy LLC doing business as Microgrid Institute in the amounts of $5,300 for consulting services or stakeholder engagement sessions. Manuel. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. I am Anona Chuin. My pronouns are he, him, his, and I'm senior infrastructure and energy planner at the BPA. Uh, on May 17, 2018, uh, this board authorized the director to enter into an agreement with the Massachusetts Clean Energy Center, MassDEC, to participate in MassDEC's community microgrid program. As part of the program, MassDEC turns us off with Burr Energy LLC doing business at Microgrid Institute, which is one of the consulting teams of MassDEC pre-qualified for the program. Uh, we were turned off in order to carry out a microgrid feasibility assessment for the Raymond Airplane Marine Park. A microgrid is an energy system for clusters of buildings that can disconnect from the electric grid when needed and continue to provide energy services to the building within a specified boundary. These systems can help organizations and municipalities achieve their sustainability, resilience, and economic development goals if defined with those goals in mind. Uh, these systems can also provide great benefits to um, electric utility companies. A microgrid at the regular framework supports one of the community energy goals of the Magic Vault in 2030, and it's aligned with our commitment to supporting the maritime industry at the Marine Park. The final report was recently submitted by the consultants to MassDEC for their final approval and the publication should be forthcoming. Uh, next slide, please. So today, oh, as part of the Marine Park program, MassDEC is available to farm rating for the participating community carry out further stakeholder engagement. Uh, so today we're requesting authorization for a number of things. First, to amend the existing agreement with MassDEC in order to one, extend the termination date of that agreement, two, agree on the timeline and scope of the use of the funding, and three, authorize the grant from MassDEC to the BPA. And second, we're also looking for authorization to execute and enter into an agreement with Burr Energy LLC doing business at the Microgen Institute for the disbursement of the funding for the services they would provide for the stakeholder engagement sessions. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, the motion is in order. So followed. Second. Okay, I'll take a roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item 
number three, request authorization to execute a memorandum of agreement with the Department of Public Works for fuel and services provided by the Fleet Maintenance Unit. unit. John. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, it should be noted that this presentation will also apply for an upcoming vote in the BRA board uh, as well. Uh, we are asking the board to authorize the director to enter into an MOA with Public Works to continue to fuel and service our vehicles uh, in order to decrease efficiencies and decrease costs as provided by the fleet. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Yes, Madam Chair. Due to the public service nature of this occupancy, 
No license fee is proposed. However, DND will be responsible to pay at the source for electricity used in the space. At the expiration of the license, the BPDA will benefit from having an improved space, which they can either which they can either market for lease or retain for future use by BPDA staff. In closing, it is recommended that the director be authorized to allow DND to use approximately 15,000 square feet of space at 12 Channel Street, Suite 902. Thank you, Maureen. Um, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, the motion is in order. Um, Thank you. Okay, take roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And fair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. One more for Maureen. Uh, request authorization to extend a sub-license consent agreement with Live Nation Worldwide Incorporated to allow Aura Seaport to install, maintain, and operate a temporary trailer as a leasing office on a portion of the premises known as the Rockland Bank Pavilion. Maureen. Thank you, Madam Chair. Rockland Trust Bank Pavilion, also known as the Pavilion, is an open-air amphitheater located at 290 North Avenue in Boston. The pavilion contains 5,200 grandstand pavilion seats and is owned and operated by Live Nation. The pavilion is a popular venue for concerts, graduations, and other large audience events. Live Nation Worldwide and a successor in interest to the Don Lord Corporation, also known as Live Nation, has been a licensee of BPDA since 2004. At the October 17, 2019 board meeting, the BPDA approved a sub-license agreement for a period of six months to begin on December 1, 2019 and end on April 30, 2020, between Live Nation and the Aurora Seaport to install, maintain, manage, and operate a temporary leasing trailer during their initial rent-up of their residential development directly across from the pavilion. These units were, were to be delivered during the spring of 2020. However, the delivery of the units has been delayed due to the temporary work shutdown and as a direct result of COVID-19. Live Nation and Aura are now requested an extension of the sub-license agreement until August 31st, 2020. Live Nation would like the BPDA to approve this extension as they continue to view themselves as a good neighbor to Aura Seaport and welcome the new residents of the development to the neighborhood. The BPDA will continue to receive 50% of the gross monthly proceeds that Live Nation receives from Morris Seaport in the amount of $1,250 for the use of a portion of their license premise. In closing, it is recommended that the director be allowed to enter the sub-license consent agreement to allow Morris Seaport to remain on a portion of Live Nation's licensed premises until August 31st of 2020. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Do you think this is going to be long enough? I actually asked them several times, and they kept reiterating that August 31st would be su sufficient. I did mention that, you know, to go back to the board is, is um, cumbersome, and they insisted that August 31st would be good for them. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any further questions? Rockland Trust Pavilion. 
due to the COVID pandemic, all concert tours uh, previously scheduled for 2020 have been canceled. Um, within the pavilion is a small sheltered VIP area consisting of approximately 5,000 square feet. Um, within the area is a full bar, um, seating, and, and restrooms. Live Nation has approached the EPA requesting to convert the VIP club into a full service bar open to the general public as a means to generate income during the forced cancellation of the concert season. Staff is recommending that the proposed uh, use be allowed on a temporary basis uh, for the balance of the concert season only as a part on the trial basis. Live Nation is currently working with the City of Austin Licensing Commission and has received a letter of approval from the Commonwealth of Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection that the proposed use on a temporary basis is consistent with the committee use in Section Chapter 91 regulations. It's anticipated that the bar will be open daily through November 2020. Um, Live Nation has agreed to pay the EPA 12.5% of the gross receipts as a license fee. Um, that fee is consistent with other beer garden type uses in the seaport and elsewhere in the Delta in the Park. Uh, the total fee received um, by the EPA, it's not possible to predict. However, it will definitely help to offset the lost revenue from park, uh, uh, the revenue that will be lost from loss, loss of parking and percentage sales of the, the tickets from the venue in the concert. What's the uh, agency's exposure uh, to risk under the uh, social distancing guidelines? They, uh, Live Nation will be required to uh, follow all regulations for social distancing um, as, as with any other uh, restaurant or venue that would be in the license. I can add just a little bit to that as well. I'm sorry, Lance Martin's Devin Park Director of Real Estate. We work very closely with the licensing board and um, we're very concerned about this issue as well. They put, uh, Live Nation put together a 14 gate plan uh, out behind their, their uh, COVID protocols and that their, uh, everything will put in place to protect their guests. It's very similar to what our food breweries are down the street, their outdoor beer garden and other locations. And then the licensing board has looked thoroughly at that as, as has. Boston Health Commission, but thank you for asking the question. We were also very concerned about it. Uh, any additional questions for the board? Okay, hearing the same none, a motion is in order. Uh, roll vote. Second. Okay, um, we'll do roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Aye. And the chair goes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Um, item number eight, product authorization to enter into a license agreement with 150 Seaport LLC for use of a portion of Three Dolphin Way, aka Park Dolphin, within the Raymond L. Flynn Marine Park for temporary storage of construction materials in connection with 150 Seaport Boulevard development in the Seaport District. Dex. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, three Dolphin Way is a 68,000 square foot building located on a three acre parcel in the Raymond Elfin Marine Park. Um, EPDA has recently issued an RFP for the redevelopment of the parcel and is currently evaluating responses. Um, in the meantime, the parcel is being utilized by BPDA for storage of operation equipment. Um, a portion of the parcel is also temporarily licensed to uh, a company for monthly parking of traffic trailers. Cronin Development Group, or 150 Seaport LLC, uh, the developer of the 150 Seaport um, uh, development, was founded in 1995 and they specialize in residential, commercial, and restaurant developments. They've also developed several restaurants in the city's neighborhoods. Uh, 150 Seaport Boulevard is a 22-story development consisting of 12,000 square feet restaurant on the first two floors, and the remaining uh, 20 floors will consist of 114 residential units. Corner broke ground on the 150 Seaport development in 2019 and is close to completing the below ground parking portion of the development. As the development moves to above grade construction, Cronin is in need of a warehouse 
to store construction materials, um, but mostly the glass curtain walls that will serve as the building's facade. We're proposing a one-year lease commencing September 1st of 2020 through August 31st of 2021. Corning will utilize approximately 70% of the building footprint and will pay $9,000 per month, which represents 70% of the market rent of the building, of the market value of the building. Um, EPDA will retain the balance of the building for its own use during the license. So, thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing is getting on a motion is in order. So moved. Okay. okay, and I'll we'll, we'll take roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number nine, request authorization to enter into temporary license agreements for EDIC owned properties for up to 30 days, Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. In 2009, in order to streamline and simplify the licensing approval process, uh, BPDA authorized the director to enter into license agreements that do not exceed five days without additional board action. Uh, BPDA periodically receives requests for the use of the property that exceeds five days, uh, but that contemplated use occurs before the next scheduled board meeting. Uh, which requires staff to request board approval after the fact. A recent example of that occurred in June when BPDA, um, the BPDA owned parking lot at Pumpkin Hill Community College was needed to conduct commercial driver's license or CDL training. Um, these types of requests are usually inappropriate use of BPDA property, um, but, they f but frequently, uh, the frequency and, and uh, predictability of the requests are, uh, are hard to predict. So accordingly, we're requesting that the director be authorized to enter into a license agreement for the use of EPDA property, not to exceed 30 days without requiring further board action. The EPDA staff will negotiate the appropriate fee, if any, depending on the proposed use and appropriate insurance will always be required. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dennis. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, the motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Lansbourne? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Uh, item number 10, request authorization to negotiate rent deferment agreements with tenants impacted by COVID-19. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. At the meeting held April 16, 2020, the board authorized the director to negotiate rent deferment agreements with BPDA tenants who suffered a dramatic loss of business due to the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, the authorization was applicable for April, May, and June rent payments only, um, which was a policy consistent with those contemplated in the private sector at that point in time. Um, it provided a dual goal of short-term relief for impacted tenants and preserving the financial health of BPDA. The basic business, mo the basic business model is to grant rent relief on a short-term basis with repayment to BPDA as soon as practical uh, to protect the financial stability of BPDA. Staff has spoken with many tenants and have distributed uh, 25 to 30 applications to businesses in our portfolio. To date, 17 applications have been received. Uh, the following tenants will be receiving rent deferment through the originally approved program. Echo Beauty Hair Salon at the China Trade Building at 2 Bolson Street. Pete's Dockside Restaurant in 12 Channel Street in the Raymond Elfo Marine Park. Live Nation um, uh, at the Barclay Trust Pavilion on Northern Avenue. Crosstown Hotel on Manly and Cass Boulevard. And Boston Harbor Cruises on Long Wharf. Although only five have been recommended for deferment at this stage, um, that number is deceiving. Every application has been reviewed and every applicant has been contacted. Some applicants withdrew the submission, opting not to disclose proprietary financial information. Others have elected to receive uh, the federal stimulus loans instead. Um, a lot of those loans were, were uh, designed to pay rent. So the, the, um, the tenants that accepted those were required to use that money to pay rent. They opted to do that rather than the rent firm program. Um, we believe that for others, 
it is more appropriate to consider rent forgiveness rather than deferment, given the tourism focus of their business and the early stages of the economic recovery. This specific request will be addressed under separate action at the Boston Redevelopment Authority coordinated uh, upcoming. Um, for, others, for others still, staff and the applicants believe that a restructuring of the existing lease via an amendment is a more appropriate avenue to address the individual financial challenges faced. Those amendments are being negotiated currently. The economic recovery is deliberate and methodical, and we remain bullish on Boston's ultimate recovery. But the recovery will continue to take time to properly and safely reach the new normal. Staff believes that the pace of economic recovery, with phase three openings only recently undertaken, warrants an extension of the rent deferment program, and we're requesting the commission to extend the rent deferment applicable period to September 30th of 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Um, do we have any questions from the board? I just want to say I appreciate the, the extra time and effort the real estate department's putting into helping our small business tenants through this difficult time. It's really important and it's really good work. Thank you. Thank you. We, we agree it's very important and we are devoting a lot of time to it. So thank you. Appreciate it. Any other questions? Hearing and seeing none, the motion is in order. No Second. Okay, I'll take roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Lansmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Dennis. Thank you. Okay, item number 11 request authorization to enter into a contract with Summit Labs for professional evaluation services of Boston Save. City of Boston's Children's Savings Account in an amount not to exceed $150,000, funded by the Michael and Susan Dell Foundation. Constance. Constance. Thank you, Madam Chair and members of the board. I'm Constance Martin from the Office of Financial Empowerment here on behalf of Boston Saves, the city's Children's Savings Account program. I came before you in February to get approval for an RFP for a three-year evaluation of $150,000 for Boston Saves funded by the Dell Foundation. Since then, our team, which had representatives from the Mayor's Office, Boston Public Schools, and OWD, duly solicited and evaluated proposals, several of which were excellent. Today, I'm requesting authorization to enter into a contract with Summit Lab, that's Lab Singular, which is led by Dr. Willie Elliott, who is the leading researcher in the country in the field of children's savings accounts. So we are very excited about working with him. And I can answer any questions you might have. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Just a clarification. So this is fully funded by the, the Dell Foundation? Yes, not only fully funded, but their interest in supporting the program was, was due to their feeling that an evaluation would be helpful. They were specifically interested in funding us because of the evaluation and have been um, interested in, in the progress we've made. Thank you. Thank you. Um, any other further questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank, Thank you. Uh, item number 12. Request authorization to enter into a consulting services contract with Brown, Gorse, and Coddington Incorporated doing business as BBC Research and Consulting to conduct a disparity study and integrate the BPDA results into the City of Boston's disparity study report for an amount not to exceed $182,484. Michelle. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Golden, Madam Secretary, members of the audience. My name is Michelle Goldberg. I'm the Budget Director of the BPDA. I'm before you today seeking authorization to complete a contract with BBC Research and Consulting in the amount of $182,484. This contract is the result of our participation in the City of Boston's procurement disparity study. 
When Mayor Walsh took office, he embarked on an effort to ensure that public entities are open and accessible when it comes to government contracts. The hope is that all areas of the public sector will achieve better diversity and equitable access in Boston. Just so folks know, I want to quickly explain what a disparity study is. Cities across the country have programs in place that focus on diverse vendors that often get left out of the public procurement process. These programs often get challenged in court. These court cases go back to the ruling on Richmond v. Crossan, uh, a case from 1989, which laid out the legal, the legal foundation for contemporary race-conscious government procurement programs. Municipalities have to be able to prove exactly what the barrier is and demonstrate how that chosen program is necessary to remedy the marketplace discrimination um, and ensure that the programs do not just simply provide preference to minority groups. Even as the programs go on, they must regularly conduct studies to monitor and collaborate, uh, calibrate the progress. And so the city of Boston's Office of Workforce Development released a request for proposal in 2017 to engage a consultant in a two-phase disparity study to consider not only the city of Boston data, but all the various quasi-public entities in Boston that are active in the government contracting marketplace. The intent is to have a unified study that helps set the foundation for a deep understanding of availability, a collaborative approach across the quasi-entities of the city, and an indisputable framework to establish a race-conscious program to promote equity and procurement. The BPDA, as a major driver of the city's uh, economic work um, and in supporter of the mayor's initiative, are excited to be at the point where we are ready to enter into an agreement with BBC in order to complete the citywide project. When BBC completes their work, I hope to bring to the board a detailed report on the findings. Thank you for your time and consideration for this request. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. Thank you. Thank you, Michelle. Um, do we have any questions from the board? When will we see results from this? Um, the goal, I think, is to um, start to wrap the project up by the end of the calendar year. Um, I think with COVID happening, they might be adjusting that timeline a bit. Um, you know, and I, I think we're, we're, we are a couple of months behind where we wanted to be. Um, and so hopefully we can kind of pick up speed um, in, the, in this last, uh, in the fall. And is this um, firm a minority or women's owned firm? I can, uh, I would have to check on that and I can certainly let you know. Um, I know that they um, had several uh, MWBEs um, as, as finalists, uh, you know, or that um, were, were in the running and under consideration, um, but I'm not sure how um, exactly if BBC is official or not. I know that they are not Boston based. Okay, I'd like to see that. Sure, absolutely. I can follow up on that. Okay, any further questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Okay, um, last item on the agenda, item number 13. I believe David is presenting? Yes, I am presenting and I'm having a little trouble with my video. I apologize for that. Still a mystery, we don't know what you look like. Well, welcome, welcome. We can hear you. Yeah. Audio, David, I think you're on mute. Oh, sorry. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Golden. Um, I'm David Pierre. I'm the Director of Human Resources. Um, we have a few items for your consideration on the EDIC agenda. We have um, three appointments with the details that are in the board memos. Sasha Bandezi, a Senior Program Manager for Boston Saves um, in the Office of Workforce Development with the start date of August 3rd, 2020. Martin Serrano, an administrative assistant in the Office of the General Counsel with the start date of July 20th, 2020. Keenan Ryan, an assistant deputy director of downtown and neighborhood planning in the planning department 
with a start date of July 20th, 2020. And we also have four employment service contractors with details listed in the board memos. Ryan Farnia in the Compliance Department, Philip Gomez in the MIS Department, Paul Cody also in the MIS Department, and Hugo Solis in the Office of the General Counsel. Thank you. Do we have um, any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, the motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, uh, we'll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you and welcome again, David. Okay, so that's the last item. I need a motion to adjourn the meeting. I'm going to adjourn the EDIC meeting. Second. Okay, we'll call for a vote. Uh, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Meeting adjourned. <laughs> Okay, we'll now begin the July BPDA board meeting. The open public meeting law requires that I notify the public that this is a meeting being that this meeting is being recorded. Please be aware that an audio and visual recording of this meeting is being made and broadcast by Boston City TV, which is a part of the City of Boston Office of Cable Communications at Xfinity Channel 24, RCN Channel 13, and Verizon Bios Channel 1962. Uh, it's also being live streamed at boston.gov slash cable. Uh, and this is the July BRA meeting, board meeting, which is being held virtually to ensure the public, to ensure the safety of the public, staff members, and the BPDA board members during the COVID-19 situation. Uh, I will now take roll call of the board members. Ms. Jacks. Present. Mr. Monahan. Present. Dr. Landsmark. Present. Mr. Miller. Present. And uh, the chair, Dr. Silver Rojas, is present. Okay, so item number one request authorization for the approval of the minutes of the June 11th, 2020 meeting. The motion is in order. So, Second. Okay, roll we'll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Lance Mark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number two request authorization to schedule a public hearing on August 13th, 2020, at 5 40 p.m., or at a date and time to be determined by the director to consider the Brigham and Women's Hospital Institutional Master Plan Amendment and Renewal. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. We'll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Item number three, request authorization to schedule a public hearing on August 13th, 2020 at 5.50 p.m. or at a date and time to be determined by the director to consider the second amendment and restated master plan for plan development area number 94 Bartlett Place, Washington Street and Bartlett Street in Roxbury, the phase four development within such plan development area. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay, and the chair votes aye, motion passes. Um, item number four, we have the Board of Appeals, Jack. Uh, thank you, Madam Chairman, members of the board, Secretary Lamas, Director Golden. Uh, Jeff Hampton, Senior Zoning Planner for the BPDA. Before you tonight are 22 petitions uh, prepared by agency staff that will be transmitted to the Board of Appeal uh, for their next three meetings, uh, July 21st, July 28th, and August 11th. Uh, many of the uh, recommendations that uh, will be going to the board over the next two weeks were actually prepared in our March 
uh, board package where there were 80 recommendations. So that's why the number of cases right now is pretty low. You'd be happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, do you have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, motion is in order. So moved. Aye. Second. <laughs> okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the pair votes aye, motion passed. Thank you, John. Thank you. Okay, item number five, request authorization to execute a memorandum of agreement with the Department of Public Works for fuel and services provided by the Fleet Maintenance Unit. John. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board. Uh, as said before in the EIC hearing, uh, we're asking the board to authorize the director to enter into an MOA with Public Works to continue our fuel and service of our vehicles uh, by their Fleet ma Maintenance Unit. Thank you. Thank you, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and saying none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. Item number five, six, <laughs> request authorization to amend the license agreement with Boston Sailing Center Incorporated for a portion of the 50,998 square foot water sheet at the end of Lewis Fork. Lauren. Madam Chairman, members of the board, Boston Sailing Center was founded in 1977. They conduct sailing courses, membership, and charters from their office and classrooms located on a Louisiana riverboat permanently docked at the end of the Lewis Wharf parking lot. Over 400 students every year take part in classes available at all skill levels. Membership programs allow sailors access to one of 73 boats to sail along Boston's historic waterfront, Boston Harbor Islands, overnight trips to Marblehead, and to destinations like Provincetown, Martha's Vineyard, and Newport. On May 1st, 1982, the BPDA licensed the license area to Boston Sailing Center to maintain five moorings for five vessels within water sheet located at the end of Lewis Port. The proposed amendment to the existing license will continue to allow access to the license area exclusively to the mooring, berthing, and docking for five BSC-owned vessels. The proposed amendment will allow for an initial five-year term, which will commence on August 1, 2020, and expire on July 31, 2025. And it contains a five-year option term. The initial extension term and extension terms will be subject to a yearly license fee of $12,000 with a yearly periodic escalation of 3.5% or a CPI, whichever is greater. Boston Sailing Center will maintain all regulatory approvals, including those required under Mass General Law Chapter 91 and the Harbor Park Municipal Harbor Plan. BSC shall maintain the mooring configuration in accordance with the approved mooring plan and any additional required considerations. The five-year extension option should be exercised at the sole discretion of the BPDA. It is therefore recommended that the director be authorized on behalf of the BPDA to amend the existing license of BSC for a portion of the water sheet at Lewis Four to allow for a new fee schedule and a set five-year term with a discretionary five-year extension term. Okay, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions for the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, um, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Uh, and the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Lauren. Item number seven, request the ratification and confirmation of a license agreement with Bill's Taxi Services Incorporated doing business as A and A Metro for the use of 25,000 square feet of space located within Bunker Hill Community College uh, parking lot number two. Warren. The New Market Business Association supports the business community in New Market, an industrial area of Boston, which is home to many industrial and food processing distribution businesses. 
the BPBA's Office of Workforce Development is a dedicated public agency working toward increasing opportunities for all Boston residents to benefit from the city's economic vitality and future. They support programs that provide Boston's workers with tools for economic advancement, including educational opportunities, job training, and financial coaching. NMBA has teamed up with the Office of the Workforce Development Job Development Initiative to fund scholarships to and facilitate locations for commercial driver's license courses. NMBA has partnered with Bill's Taxi Service to fulfill the education requirements of the CBL program. Due to COVID-19 restriction, the New Market Business Association and Bill's Taxi, taxi Service were unable to secure a privately owned location for the practical portion of CBL licensure instruction. Time being of the essence, uh, and the NMBA reached out to the BPBA requesting the short-term use of the lot at Bunker Hall Hill Community College. The BPBA granted a two-week license agreement to Bill's Taxi. The term of the license commenced on June 22, 2020 and terminated on July 2. Bill's Taxi carried comprehensive public liability insurance, insuring the BPBA, the City of Boston, and Bill's Taxi against all claims and demands for personal injury and property damage. And uh, due to the community benefits provided by this program and to support the goals of the Mayor's Office of Workforce Development, no fee was proposed. We ask that the board ratify and confirm the agreement allowing the 10-day license with Bill's Taxi for the use and occupancy of approximately 25,000 square feet within parking lot two located at Bunker Hill Community College. Thank you. Um, all right, do we have any questions from the board? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. Um, Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Mr. Miller? Aye. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, and the chair votes aye, so motion passes. Thank you. Item number eight, request authorization to enter into a lease agreement with the Boston Public Library for use of 1,695 square feet of space in the China Trade Building, Suite G05, located at 2 Boylston Street, Lauren. In 2017, Mayor Walsh announced the creation of a temporary library facility to serve the needs of Boston's Chinatown community. That facility is located in the lower level of the China Trade Building, 2 Boylston Street. It opened in 2018 and is now a functioning branch of the Boston Public Library System. The review of viable sites for a permanent location for the library services in Chinatown will continue. As plans develop, the Boston Public Library hopes to continue meeting the needs of the community from this location. The proposed lease term will be for five years, commencing on August 1st, 2020, and ending July 31st, 2025. The lease may be extended through July 31st, 2030, at the sole discretion of the BPBA. Boston Public Library agrees to pay operating expenses calculated at $12 per square foot for the initial five-year term. If the BPBA grants a five-year extension, operating expenses will be calculated at $14 per square foot beginning on August 1st, 2025. These charges are consistent with other tenant fees of China Tree. The lease premises are to be used exclusively as public library branch, including the functions of book and media storage, library administered program and events, administrative office, and provision of technological resources for the public. We're asking the director to be authorized to enter into a five-year lease agreement with Boston Public Library for the use and occupancy of approximately 1,695 square feet on the lower level of the China Trade Building. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, um, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Uh, Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. 
Item number nine, request authorization to amend the existing license agreement with CHLN Incorporated to extend the expiration date for the use of approximately 5,375 square feet of BRAO land for outdoor seating for the Chart House restaurant on Mall 4 and to abate the license fee payments. Dennis or Lauren, somebody? That was Dennis. Dennis, are you on mute? Dennis, you're on mute. Thank, thank you, Madam Chair. I apologize for that mix-up. I didn't catch that uh, on the agenda. Um, BPDA owns two parcels of land that immediately abut uh, the Child House restaurant on Long Wharf. Um, the parcels combine to over 5,375 square feet. Uh, the Child House restaurant has used the parcels for outdoor seating since 2009. In June of 2019, 2019, BPD entered into the most recent license for the Child House, which was scheduled to expire on May 31st of 2020. Um, in May of 2020, the BPD board voted to extend the license to August 31st um, and to forego rent from the Child House until such time that they reopened for business. Um, they, of course, like every other restaurant, was closed due to the COVID um, uh, crisis. Um, the child has since reopened in late June 2020 and would, and would now be obligated to pay a license fee of just over $8,000 per month. Um, Coterminously, Mayor Walsh recently announced that the licensing board for the city of Boston will be streamlining permitting for restaurants to temporarily expand on the outdoor uh, parcels. Restaurants that expand on the property owned by the city of Boston will not be charged a fee. We are today requesting that the license with the Child House Restaurant be extended to March 31st of 2021. And for consistency with the licensing board's policy, we're recommending that the Child House not be charged a fee for the duration of the license. In the event that BPDA considers an extension of the license commencing April 1st of 2021, uh, staff will reevaluate the market at that time and an appropriate license fee will be established for board consideration. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Do we have any questions from the board? Just one comment. Um, I'm all for supporting small business, but I believe the Chart House is owned by Landry's, one of the largest restaurant owners in the world. So I'm just wondering if they have strong financial capacity and that wouldn't really be a hardship for them. So. We had discussed that with Landry's. They 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 operate each each um, each of the restaurant operates as a, a standalone franchisee almost for the sake of paying the bills. And um, we want to incentivize the Chados to open uh, for their own portion. Um, and uh, we also were wanted consistency with the the, the public policy that the, the mayor's office had established. So your, your point is well taken, and we did consider that. Um, but at the, at the end of the day, we thought about it, and we'd recommend, we're, we thought it was better to be consistent with the mayor's policy than, uh, than not to be. Understood. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any additional questions from the board? OK, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Second. Oh, for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number 10, request to enter into a temporary license agreement with Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital, Spalding Adaptive Services Center's Wine Garden Program for the use of a portion of the pier adjacent to Menino Park or Mora. Warren. Warren. Sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board. This is my last one today. Spalding Adaptive Sports Center Wine Garden Program has been operating the city of Boston since 2001. They provide a bridge between rehabilitation and returning to an active lifestyle. They serve over a thousand individuals with physical and cognitive challenges annually. They provide a wide berth of adaptive land and water sports from their operations center located at the pier behind Spalding in Charlestown. 
the wine garden program, land-based programs, require additional space this season to maintain compliance with COVID-19 guidelines with respect to social distancing and to provide rehabilitation services to as many patients as possible. They've requested use of approximately 15,000 square feet of BRA-owned pier adjacent to Menino Park. The terms of this license commenced on July 6, 2020 and will terminate on October 31, 2020. In order to permit Spalding to begin using the license area on July 6, the license agreement was executed pursuant to the authority granted by the board to enter into 30-day license agreements for COVID-19 relief and recovery efforts. Upon approval of this memorandum by the board, the license agreement will, by its terms, automatically be extended to October 31st, 2020. The license agreement contains BPDA standard terms and conditions, including without limitation, requiring that Spalding comply with all laws, code rules, regulations, or ordinances, including any ordinances related to COVID-19. Because the proposed use is for a not-for-profit rehabilitation hospital and is made necessary by COVID-19 social distancing guidelines, no fee is proposed. We're therefore recommending that the director be authorized on behalf of the BRA to execute a license agreement to Spalding Adaptive Sports Center Wine Garden Program for the use of approximately 15,000 square feet of BRA-owned pier adjacent to Menino Park. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you. Okay, item number 11, request authorization to enter into rate abatement, abatement agreements with COVID-19 impacted tenant. Data, uh, Dennis. Dennis Davis. <laughs> Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, before I jump into, uh, before I dive in, I just want to point out, um, Carol, Carol graciously thanked the real estate department for all of our hard work in the rent deferment program, uh, which, which we certainly have been working hard. Um, I'd be remiss not to point out there's a core group in the law department, finance department, and development review that have been working in lock, lockstep with us, me in particular. Um, it's, it's really been an all hands on deck effort um, because it is so important. So I just want to give a tip of my hat to my colleagues in the other departments. Um, as referenced in the previous EDIC meeting, a few select, a few select businesses are not able to benefit from the rent deferment program because uh, their licenses expire in 2021 and the licenses cannot be extended because they were uh, created as a result of an RFP process that ends in 2021. We'd have to reissue the RFPs. Um, therefore, uh, deferred rent to a later period is, is impractical. Uh, we're, rec we're recommending that the following three licenses be considered for rent abatement. All three are located on Long Wharf and rely exclusively on tourism to generate a customer base. Um, TNTs uh, sells t-shirts and Boston memorabilia. City View Trolley uh, ticket sales for the trolley tours of, of Boston. And the New England Aquarium has the popular dog and claw vending, uh, uh, vending location just outside of their entrance, which sells snacks and drinks to long wharf visitors. The economic shutdown and gubernatorial and mayoral COVID-related executive orders have not permitted the vendors to open yet in 2020. We're requesting forgiveness of the rent owed through, through the period when the vendors were not open on site. We're also requesting that the first month that they do open be at no charge. Uh, however, full rent will be payable commencing the second month that they are open. Uh, we think that giving them the first month for free would, be, would incentivize them to open and would give them a nice a baseline to know whether they'll be able to afford the full rent going forward after that month. Um, we do not believe that the vendors will ever be able to generate enough business to catch up on the cumulative rent owed as well as paying full rent going forward. Uh, the nature of their business precludes many return customers. From a macroeconomic perspective, we want to provide an incentive for the vendors to open and encourage tourism to assist in the economic recovery. 
In closing, I'd be remiss not to point out that the monetary value of rent forgiveness that's represented in the board memorandum reflects a worst case scenario wherein they do not open at all between now and March 21st, uh, March of 2021. We anticipate the vendors would be opening in August. They're, they're, they're thinking about that now. They're talking to us about that now. And actually, we think that the, the monetary value of the rent forgiveness would be about half of what's represented in the board memorandum. But we wanted to provide full disclosure in the case of a worst case scenario. Thank you. I have one question. <clears throat> Dennis, I saw that Sam Adams just closed um, its patio at the Panyo Hall um, for service. Uh, they felt it wasn't, they had been open for a few weeks and felt it wasn't safe having so many out of state visitors uh, to their business. How, how are all of our tourist dependent tenants? going to operate safely when you know given the difficulties are, are you guys dealing helping I, you deal with that i um I, we i understand exactly the point you're making and and we're not positive how they're going to fare um that's why we want to incentivize them and giving them a free month the free trial just to um, um to kick off um in the rent deferment program, Boston Harbor Cruises um, is, is suffering a lot of a lot of revenue loss. It's not, uh, tourism is their sole source of income, uh, but it is it is a major source of their income. So I don't I don't have the answer to that question. Other than we want to try to work with these businesses to incentivize them uh, to to open and to help help the economy as a whole. Um, I wish I had a better answer for you than that, Carol, but... It's okay. It's, it's, it's a very tough circumstance, tough context to operate, really. It, is. None of us have been through this before, so we're all, we're all muddling through together. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions from the board? Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Uh, Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you, Dennis. Item number 12, request authorization to negotiate rent deferment agreements with tenants impacted by COVID-19. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. This is the same presentation from the um, EDIC meeting. I'm happy to repeat it for the public record if you would like. Um, um, I don't yeah. think that we need to, unless the uh, board, do you have any, any questions on this? Mm -hmm. Is that? No. Okay. You're going to see none. A motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. Okay, and the chair votes aye, motion passes. Item number 13, request authorization to enter into temporary license agreements for BRA owned properties for up to 30 days, Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, as with the previous board item, this this is also the exact same one that was presented at the EDIC meeting. Uh, any uh, additional questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. We roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Dennis. Item number 14, request authorization to execute a second amendment to the Alston Brighton Mobility Consultant Service Contract with Kittleton and Associates Incorporated for an increase in $41,000 and an extension extension of term. John. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Rojas, uh, Vice Chair Monahan, Director Golden, Secretary Pahimas, and members of the board. I'd also like to acknowledge our newest board member, Brian Miller. Welcome to you, Mr. Miller. I'm Tad Reed, Senior Deputy Director for Transportation and Infrastructure Planning. Next slide. 
As you may recall, in fall 2018, the board authorized the director to enter into a contract with Kittleson to prepare the Alston Bright Mobility Study. Shown in this slide is the study area. Responding to community concerns about the ability of transportation infrastructure to keep pace with new development, the purpose of this study is to identify improvements that will accommodate additional demands while making the multimodal network safer and more comfortable for all users. In March and July of 2019, the board authorized the director to amend the contract for the first time with Kittleson to increase the contract amount and extend the term of the contract by three months to coordinate with the timing of the Western Avenue Corridor study currently underway. Right now, the contract with Kittleson is due to expire on July 30. The previously authorized contract increase was fully expended on analyzing mobility improvement options during the summer and fall of 2019. Next slide, please. Since kicking off the AB Mobility Study, the team has successfully moved through the project through multiple phases as shown in this slide. Each phase, data collection, issue and goal identification, alternatives testing, draft recommendations, and so on, has been accompanied by robust public engagement. Next slide, please. For example, as shown in this slide, during the most recent phase involving review of draft uh, preliminary draft recommendations, we received over 350 comments from nine community meetings, 250 comments via email, and 100 comments from the interactive online mapping tool. All told during this phase, we received over 700 comments. It's worth noting that even prior to the pandemic, nearly half of all public comments we received were through online engagement. Due partly to numerous requests from business and community groups for additional community meetings, and partly due to our pause in public engagement during the initial stage of the pandemic, more time is needed now to complete the project. Next slide. Going forward, we plan to release the, AB mobility, the draft AB Mobility Plan in late summer. Public review of the draft plan will take place in early fall, and we anticipate returning to the board to adopt the final AB, uh, AB Mobility Plan in late fall. To accommodate this schedule change, staff recommends extending the term of their contract to December 30th. In addition to the term extension, staff is recommending that the contract amount be increased by 41,000. This will pay for the following, additional community meetings and interdepartmental meetings, additional time and analyses needed to respond to public comments, and additional meetings with external agencies and stakeholders such as MassDOT, the MBTA, and the Department of Conservation and Recreation. In conclusion, staff recommends that the director be authorized to execute a second amendment to the contract with Kittleson, to increase the contract amount by $41,000, and to extend the term through December 30th. This concludes the presentation, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Ted. Any questions from the board? How does this intersect with the uh, mass DOT work uh, that's gotten so much publicity recently uh, around uh, planning through the neck along the uh, Star Drive uh, neck down? Well, that's a, a great question, and thank you for that question. Um, I happen to be uh, the person representing the, the BPDA on that project, so I have been with the um, uh, the Alston I-90 project since its inception about five years ago. Um, this is, a, a, for those of you who may not be aware, this is a um, mass DOT proposal to, um, to rebuild the elevated viaduct of the mass turnpike through the Alston interchange. And while rebuilding it, uh, clean up the spaghetti of uh, on-ramps and off-ramps extending from that infrastructure to local streets to free up land for a whole new neighborhood, basically. Um, and the, the, one of the more, the thorniest pieces of that project is the narrow band of land that uh, threads, that the Mass Turnpike uh, occupies between Boston University and the river. It's a very, very tight amount of space and it's particularly tricky getting all the required infrastructure that includes the mass turnpike, um, the commuter rail, um, uh, there is freight rail that goes through there, and the Paul Dudley White uh, bike pet path that goes through. There's a lot that squeezes through there, and it's very tricky uh, 
um, to get all, rebuild all that in such limited space um, during the construction process, which is going to last between six and ten years. Um, I am the same person working on both projects. Um, there are some overlapping issues. For example, we see an opportunity for some of the recommendations of the AB Mobility Study, which um, will be presented to you in the fall, to be implemented through the I-90 project. And we will be talking more about that when we come to you in the fall. Does that help? Yeah, yes. Um, yeah. You know, the impression that the media is giving is that uh, a number of those decisions have already been made um, and, and are kind of locked in. And so I wonder how this uh, might impact um, on, on some of those uh, uh, predetermined engineering choices? Well, um, the, the throat area is actually um, uh, on the periphery of the Alston Brighton Mobility Study. Those are very important issues. I, I will say that the mayor is very engaged at his level on this um, with the governor. Um, it, it has been frustrating because the uh, community has been very interested in improving the quality of the waterfront on the river and widening the Paul Dudley White Path long term. There's been a lot of resistance at the state level to that. Again, the mayor is very engaged on those issues. Um, I can just tell you we have a, a Chief Osgood from uh, Chief of Streets is extremely engaged on this. So we're, we're basically all over that project and doing everything we can to advocate the community's interest and the city's interest. Thanks, that's good. Thank you. Any additional questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. The motion passes. Thank you. Okay, item number 15, request authorization to enter into a second contract amendment with NBBJLP for the downtown planning study to extend the term of the contract by eight and to extend the term of the contract by eight months. Ken. Good afternoon, members of the board, Director Golden, Secretary Paul Hemus. Uh, my name is Kenan Ryan. I'm a senior planner in downtown and neighborhood planning, and I'm the project manager for Plan Downtown. So on August 16, 2018, the BPDA authorized the director to enter into a contract with NBBJ for the downtown planning study, which we now call Plan Downtown, uh, in an amount not to exceed $600,000. On September 21st, 2018, we executed that contract. Um, at this point, there are no changes to the scope of services that we're requesting. Um, on November 14, 2019, the director was authorized on behalf of the BPDA to execute an amendment to that contract um, to increase the amount by $150,000. The increased allocation of $150,000 was to fund production work and attendance to the planned downtown advisory group meetings, which were not in the original contract. Um, the BPDA and NBBJ entered into that amended contract on January 24, 2020. Uh, the official contract, the official contract as amended by the first contract shall, is now referred to as, as the amended contract. So this will be the second one. Um, when Mayor Walsh declared a state of emergency in mid-March, the BPDA paused the public review process for all development projects and planning initiatives. BPDA staff planned to host two additional advisory group meetings and one public meeting before the release of the draft plan downtown document for public comment. Since the public review process was temporarily paused and BBJ and its subconsultants paused all work associated with the project, BPDA, BPDA staff recommends that the director be authorized to execute a contract amendment um, for the planned downtown contract to extend the term by eight months to April 30th, 2021. There's no additional cost associated with this contract extension and no additional st scope for the con the for NBBJ. Um, the current contract termination date is August 31st, 2020. Um, we are requesting the eight-month extension in case um, we start to ramp back up with planning on this project, and then um, you know there's a second wave or something like that that pauses the process again. But really, we see that there's about two and a half to three months left of work uh, on this plan. 
please let me know if you have any additional questions. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. <coughs> Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. Item number 16. Request authorization to extend the final designation of EBCDC Incorporated, the nonprofit affiliated with East Boston Community Development Corporation for the lease and redevelopment of 146 through 172 Condor Street in East Boston. Dennis. Thank you, Madam Chair. In October of 2016, the board awarded tentative designation status to the East Boston Community Development Corporation for the development of the seven acre parcel at 146 Condor Street in East Boston. Uh, their intent is to develop a maritime industrial center consistent with the goals of the RFP, port regulations and city of Boston zoning. As I've reported in previous board meetings, the development will take several years due to the complexities of the site itself and, and the port related regulations which restrict the, um, uh, the uh, what can be developed on the site. Several development milestones have been established and the first of which was to have a fully executed lease. At the meeting held in April 2020, the board graciously extended the deadline uh, to, for the execution of the lease to July 31st of 2020. Although great strides have been made by BPDA and the East Boston CDC business and legal teams uh, toward finalizing this complicated lease, we're, we're not quite there, but we are very close. In fact, uh, BPDA sent our latest counter to East Boston CDC's council just yesterday. Uh, we're very aggressively negotiating this lease document. Um, it's one of the most complicated leases that I've been involved in in my tenure here. Uh, we're requesting an extension for the execution of the lease to September 30th of 2020, and I'm uh, very confident that we will have the fully executed lease in advance of that date. Thank you. Thank you, Dennis. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. I'll move. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. So, thank you. Thank you. Item number 17, request authorization to award tentative designation to Mill Street Cooperative Incorporated as redeveloper of 15 Mill Street for 10 off street parking spaces. Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. We are requesting board approval to tentatively designate the Mill Street Cooperative for the sale of 15 Mill Street in Roxbury. 15 Mill Street is a 3,000 square foot parcel on a narrow residential street. Since 1986, the BPDA has licensed this parcel to the Mill Street Cooperative for residential off-street parking. At a well-attended community meeting held in April 2019, neighbors expressed the desire for the parcel to remain off-street parking and not be considered for development. Accordingly, the BPDA issued an RFP on February 26, 2020 for the sale of 15 Mill Street for permanent off-street parking for up to 10 vehicles. Mill Street Cooperative submitted the sole proposal for this RFP. Their proposal will maintain the premises as a parking lot and make improvements such as adding planters, new paving and drainage, and new striping. The cooperative is made up of a diverse group of neighbors, and as such, the sale will increase property ownership of people of color in the city. An appraisal commissioned by the BPDA in February 2020 valued the parcel at $90,000. The cooperative offered a price of $50,000, which is the parcel's appraised value, net previous rent payments, and the cost of improvements made by the cooperative to date. In light of the fact that the cooperative's proposal was the only one received and the fact that their proposal is supported by the community, the BPDA is willing to accept this purchase price. I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Morgan. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. 
Item number 18, request authorization to extend the tentative designation of Madison Tropical LLC as a redeveloper of a portion of parcel 10 of the Southwest Corridor Development Plan known as parcel B and to extend the temporary license agreement for this continued use of parcel 10B for parking. Dana. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Golden and Secretary Pozinas. I'm Dana Whiteside, Deputy Director for Community Economic Development with the agency. The request this evening in relation to the parcel 10 project is basically under consideration for the third phase of the overall project you probably recall that this overall development was approved in 2013, with uh, phase one being tropical foods expansion, phase two being the 2101 Washington Street residential, and phase three, 2085. Uh, 2085 was originally approved to be a mixed use commercial and retail development. In the intervening years, the development team has worked assiduously to find a, an appropriate tenant for commercial and retail, but did not, did not meet with success. Uh, the time frame undertaken by the development team, which includes Madison CDC, has resulted in their realization that the perhaps better use of program would be a mixed use that includes a uh, combination of residential and a smaller amount of retail. In September of 2019, a notice of project change Proposal was submitted to the agency and a uh, set of conversations with the project review committee to look at that concept. And that concept was met with general approval. The idea is to create approximately 6,000 square feet of retail, approximately 134 units of uh, housing, which includes both rental and home ownership, with a focus on good affordability for the district and 52 uh, above grade parking spaces, whereas the original proposal uh, contemplated the construction of below grade parking. Once again, the, the concept of that change was met with approval by the project review committee, but there was much more work that needed to be done on the part of Madison Tropical to number one, find a partner, and number two, further its designs. Fast forward to the current time, the development team has partnered with Trinity Financial and has spent the last several months working on solidifying its design, working with DPDA staff, and also solidifying the elements of their program and looking through finance considerations. In light of the fact that during the last uh, period, we've all not been engaging with uh, the public for public conversation, the uh, development team has still worked with the BPDA staff and is preparing its designs. The next steps would be to, number one, share designs and considerations with the project review committee. We will be starting to engage in more public conversation with them and the oversight committee, and also prepare for uh, review and approval of the design through the Boston Civic Design Commission. Hence the request for this extension. I'm, I'll stop my comments there and I'm happy to answer any questions. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, um, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monaghan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes. Thank you. Item number 19. Request authorization to issue a certificate of appro approval pursuant to Article 80E-6, Small Project Review of the Zoning Code for the construction of 27 residential condominium units, including four ideal units, one ground floor commercial unit, 12 parking spaces, and 24 bicycle storage spaces located at 185 through 191 Geneva Avenue, subject to BPDA design review, to approve the change of ownership to Geneva Realty Group LLC and to take all related actions. Tim. Uh, good afternoon, Chair Rojas, uh, members of the board, Director Golden, Secretary Bolimas. Um, This is a, a small project that was approved by this board on March 15th, 2018. Um, it's a small project on Geneva Avenue, um, uh, five stories, 56 feet tall, approximately 31,653 square feet. 
um, for 27 rental units. Um, I think there, there may be an error in the agenda. It may say condominium units. These are actually rental units. Oh. Um, that's, so um, the, these are rentals, four IDP units, um, eight, uh, eight vehicle spaces on the ground floor. Um, just as a, as a reminder, this is a, a project that is consistent with the Fair Mount Indigo Planning Initiative uh, station area study for uh, the four corners Geneva Ave uh, station on the Fairmount line. Um, so this is a, a real feather in the cap of the agency for achieving our, our, our planning goals. Uh, there was a change in ownership uh, last year um, that, that you just described, uh, Chair Rojas. Um, no changes to the project, um, but uh, they have not yet executed uh, their uh, legal agreements and uh, had their uh, construction documents uh, uh, approved yet. So uh, we wanted to bring this back to the board for their approval. So uh, if you've got any questions about the project, uh, happy to answer them. Okay, thank you. Any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Item number 20. Request authorization to issue a determination pursuant to section 80A-6 of the zoning code in connection with the notice of project change for the Winthrop Center project to eliminate the residential portion of the East Tower and to convert the space into a rental program, reduce the residential square footage by 89,587 square feet, reduce the residential units from 387 to 321, and reduce the overall building size by 98,021 square feet to execute a revised for affordable housing agreement, an amendment to the cooperation agreement, an amendment to the development impact project agreement, an amendment to the Boston residents construction employment plan, and if required, an amendment to the sale and construction agreement by and between the BPDA and uh, MCAF Winthrop LLC and an amendment to the memorandum and to take all related actions, KC. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Golden, Madam Secretary. I'm Casey Hines, Senior Project Manager in the Development Review Department within the BPDA. We're once again before you this evening to discuss the 115 Winthrop Square project, now known as Winthrop Center. As you may recall, this project was originally approved by this board in May of 2018, following the sale of the city-owned Winthrop Square Garage. A subsequent notice of project change was approved in November of 2019. Today, we ask you to consider a second notice of project change, which was filed with the BPDA on June 10th, 2020, in response to the COVID crisis. In a moment, the proponent will explain in detail how recent changes in the economy have affected the status of the project. While the BPDA staff were confident that these changes um, to this project and presumably many others may be necessary as a result of the ongoing global pandemic, we also felt it was essential to commission a third party independent evaluation of the proponent's finances to verify the need for the modifications. That analysis has now been completed by the firm Ernst & Young and confirms the need for the changes set forth in the second NPC, which include eliminating the residential portion of the East Tower converting the residential component to initially be a rental program, reducing the residential square footage by approximately 90,000 gross square feet, and reducing the unit count from 387 to 321, all of which results in an approximately 98,000 gross square foot reduction to the overall building size. The Great Hall, now called the Connector, remains at its previously approved size and the parking and office components also remain unchanged from the 2019 approvals. Outside of a modified IDP obligation to reflect the rental units with the option to convert back to condo, all mitigation community benefits associated with the project remain the same, and the full $151 million sale proceeds remain in place. An updated wind study has been completed in response to the second NPC, which will be included as part of the BPA staff's ongoing design review. A virtual impact advisory group meeting open to the public was held on June 29th, where the second NPC was presented and discussed. The comment period then closed on June 10th, 2020. 
excuse me, July. At this time, I'd like to introduce Joe Larkin and Kathy McNeil from Millennium Partners to walk you through the presentation. Thank you, Ms. Hines, um, and thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Director Golden and Executive Secretary Palhambas. I'm here, I'm a principal with Millennium Partners, MP Boston, and I'm here with my partner, Kathy McNeil. Um, I want to spend a moment on uh, what we have been facing here and then and kind of go through the building a little bit and then be available to answer any questions you might have on this matter. Um, I would say that um, we are, construction has been going on now for well over a year. Um, the foundation is in and we have begun vertical transportation, vertical uh, construction of this project here like this. Uh, we are proceeding towards a closing out of a construction loan um, of about $800 million um, and we got caught. Um, where our lender uh, was very much concerned about um, the lending community to find both participant banks and also about the, uh, the fallout of the COVID-19 crisis that we're all facing. Um, that fallout, um, there's the uncertainty related to that had, especially around the for sale condominiums, has pretty much uh, forced us into a position here of adjusting this project in order to reduce almost $100 million in costs um, while still putting the same uh, amount of equity into this project that we want so that the total cost of the project now is, remains about $1.3 billion of which about $525 million of, a, of equity is being put in here. Um, this effort is all about getting back on track. We've been stopped construction now for a little while. Kathy McNeil, who's also our principal in charge of construction, that's her primary responsibilities here across the board. Um, we'll talk about that in any kind of detail you would like. Um, but basically, we're trying to get back into construction here. Um, and it's a, it requires us to put together a capital structure and a program that's more reflective of what the capital markets would, would want. And in this case, in particular, it's the conversion of this building or the change of, of this building, the residential portion, into four uh, rent apartments as opposed to for sale. Um, we're hoping that this is that this will change down the road, um, but with but but at this particular time, um, the lending institutions are requiring this in order to be a, as a condition of funding. Um, we are this is if with your approval and here tonight, um, this puts us on that pathway and allows us to um, proceed with the, the lending institutions that we're working through who have made these things requirements for us for us to, for us to continue. Um, it's our goal here, um, although it can't be a promise at this moment here, but it is our goal that, uh, that this project will be back in ramping up here and into construction fully uh, in the, uh, by, mid, by mid September. Um, and this issue here today, uh, is a condition precedent uh, for that. I, I have to say that, um, also I'll say just two other things very quickly here, and that is that I wanna thank the members of the public who've, and, and the city uh, the city people here, the people who work for you and also other members of the city, just to kind of fully understand exactly the, the things that are going on here that allows for this project to, to proceed. And it will take um, sort of a, a significant effort on the, on the public sector's part um, in order to do this, um, we're fully committed. Um, if we have our financing to continue, you know, to continue with our equity commitments to this project here, um, and what we really want to do is is to get this project with tons of stakeholders, both direct and indirect, um, back performing for all of us and for them, like that. So, and Kathy, can you do, we'll now go through the project a little bit and show you exactly what the changes look like? Great, thank you, members of the um, commission and. Uh, um, PPDA staff really appreciate all the efforts everyone put into helping us get to this point today. I could have the next slide, please. Uh, the building uh, is intended to remain as an iconic piece of architecture as was approved in the past. You will notice the drawing on the left hand side has a small wing at the back. That wing is what's referred to as the residential east tower. And that is the, the portion of the building that we are now eliminating. Next slide. Uh, what that does is there was a section of residential that was above the office wing. Uh, this results in approximately $90,000 square foot reduction. Next slide, please. Uh, it, from the South Station side, 
Um, as you can see, the building will now focus as one tower as opposed to two towers. And the cap on the right side is the top of the office portion of the building. And one of the major cost saving measures and the reason um, in some respects for the East Tower deletion, not only to mention the architecture, which the BCDC approved in July, really um, liking the new design much better. But one of the cost saving measures is that at the cap, there is a structural mat um, that is a fairly complicated and expensive piece. By removing the East Tower, that structural mat is no longer required in that particular area. Next slide, please. This illustrates a little bit better what I was just mentioning about the structural mat. So you can see that a portion of the tower is removed. There was also a bridge that connected the East Tower residential units, making those the most inefficient units. That East Tower actually contained 80 units. Uh, as part of the review, we also reduced the size of some of the units in the West Tower that allowed us to keep 321 units. Next slide. Uh, this is to show you what some of the new views will look like from some of the key areas in the city. Next slide. From Post Office Square, you can see the before and now the after slide. So uh, honestly, there'll be more daylighting uh, into the public space. Next slide. From South Station, you'll still get uh, the iconic architecture of the tower. Next slide. As Casey mentioned at the beginning, Winthrop Center will continue to honor its public benefits. A little bit difficult to read this slide, but we have already paid $102 million for the property. Uh, the housing and linkage requirements will remain the same. We have already started to make those payments. Matter of fact, we have worked with JVC to utilize some of the linkage money for this project to do job training for folks in the city with job needs in the downtown area. Uh, we will be funding 250,000 toward the planning study that um, was mentioned earlier that's underway. That money has been funded. Uh, $150,000 toward police security in the downtown area. Half of that money has already been um, allocated. We have a blue bikes and we have uh, signalization improvements and we have 250,000 for a rapid bus study that's also been funded. Uh, the continuing commitment to the public garden in the Boston Common remains the same, that deal that was done with the Friends, as is a historic fund commitment, which we uh, negotiated with Mass Historical Commission, that remains the same. Very importantly to us, we think it, this will remain the largest passive house. And uh, amid COVID, what we have discovered is the passive house has the wonderful benefit of also being able to provide a very healthy building to its occupants. Part of that is the fresh air requirements that are you know, built into the overall passive house concept. So we're very excited to be able to maintain that. This will allow Winthrop Senate to continue to be first class state of the art uh, office space. Next slide wanted to briefly mention to you where we are with our equity and inclusion for this project. This was one of the few and first projects that signed a memorandum of understanding with the city in order to increase not only construction workforce, which as we all know has been around for a long time, but to enter into um, design and development contracts also with minority vendors throughout the city. So we currently have um, 63 million construction contracts committed to minority and women-owned businesses. Our workforce goals are outlined there. I do want to point out on the workforce goals, the 29% where the goal is 40% people of color. One of the things that we've done on this project is we've fed the pipeline. So I'm not seeing the benefits on this job, but we work with 15 uh, members of the community uh, happen to be 15 black men volunteers who are mentoring young people. We now have 35 young people 
in the union apprenticeship programs. Now they're apprentices, so they are spread out across the city. I don't get that many on the Winthrop Center project. So they are in the system. Uh, in 2022, we have 22 members that are coming into the program. Uh, of them, all the city of Boston residents, uh, 19 are people of color, three are female. So we're excited about that project and we think that we will start to see um, those numbers improve our people of color numbers in the next couple of years as they complete their apprenticeship programs. Design contracts, I've been pleasantly surprised that in the design community, we do have a lot of very qualified uh, minority owned and women owned designers, everything from our landscape contractor to our sound and our acoustician. Um, we have uh, folks that Dream Collaborative has been a collaborative architect working with us uh, and that process has taught us a lot. Um, Joe is working very um, diligently if we can if we can put the capital structure back together to also be able to introduce um, some minority participation at some point in the capital stack for this project. Next slide. And as Joe mentioned, um, this project has started to go vertical. The first floor is poured and what you see coming out of the ground is the cores, one for the office, one for the residential. They are about at the second floor and that's the point at which we had uh, stopped construction. Construction is suspended now. There is a little bit of utility work going on, but I have had to um, temporarily shut down the site. So um, we welcome questions and we are really looking forward to being able to pull this back together again and move forward. Did that conclude your presentation? Yes, thank you. Yes, thank you. Okay, um, great. So we'll start with questions. Um, I do have one. Um, so if I recall correctly, um, a portion of the community benefits uh, from this project were going to help uh, fund uh, some additional affordable housing uh, projects in Chinatown. Um, how has that been impacted by, and has this been impacted by um, the change that you're requesting? Yeah, so it has been impacted. Um, this, we're, the, par the parcel we're talking about is parcel 12, which uh, that we are maintenantively designated with, with uh, Tufts New England Medical Center. Um, the Corcoran, the Corcoran companies through the Corcoran Hotel there, and our community partner, Asian CDC. Uh, there, it's about 155 to 170 unit uh, affordable housing project that we were in front of you guys a little while ago, and that tentative designation has been extended, I believe, last um, uh, last month uh, for another year. Um, the way it's it's been affected initially right now is that our commitment here. Um, we're still committed to seeing this project forward here with our partners. Um, there's a number of challenges over there included uh, from, from, with our partners. Um, we feel that over in the next year here, we'll be able to solidify that project and find out exactly what the obstacles are so that we can then move it forward. We're, we are committed to that and so are our partners. The biggest impact is, is that the, um, the financial commitment here on a rental basis is about $22 million here that I believe with the BPDA's approval for this, they would continue to send that money and that efforts towards uh, parcel 12. Um, and if we are, uh, and if there is some uh, change in the market or in the lending market, and if we see Boston coming back the way we expected to come back here like this, and we're able to, to go to for sale condominiums, that commitment for affordable housing goes right back up to where it was where it was before, in which case that $22 million um, will be just about $48 million here across the board. So we're hoping that's the case. Um, I think the city and, and us will be, um, and Asian CDC will be looking for some, you know, the possibility of, of some funding sources that might come in earlier, okay, in order to sort of kickstart this project. But right now as a team, uh, as a development team, through one of our affiliated partners, affiliated companies, um, we're right in the middle of that with uh, with Tufts, Asian CDC, and the hotel to really understand, um, you know, you know, in what capacity can each one of, of those guys move forward as well. So it's a bit complex, um, but there's a full commitment on our part 
um, and our partners' parts to sort of try to see this thing through. And I think that was the basis of the the extension there, the tentative designation last month. Chair, I'll ask and just jump in for one second to answer that question also on behalf of the DPA's real estate team uh, and the partnership we built with the city of Boston on this project. I, I think it's just really important to say that the city and the BPDA remain incredibly committed to seeing an affordable housing project built at parcel P12 in Chinatown. Uh, and the and tentative designated team, which includes Lonnie, and we remain fully, and agency EC, we fully committed to working with them to see that project through. There is, of course, uh, some additional financial hardship that it, uh, from the change to rental, and so we're gonna have to figure out how to plug that gap, but we're, but we're working very hard on that. And I, well, I know that the uh, BPA board members know this. Um, I think it's important to know that that, that property, P12C, is a, owned by the BPDA, and so we do have a significant degree of control over what happens at that, at that site, and the community has worked with us for many years now to, to, to uh, bring this vision of an affordable housing development forward at that location. So we're, the, uh, there, there's lots of work ahead, uh, but we are steadfastly committed to that. Okay, thank you. And one last question. Um, so Casey, I know you mentioned that um, we, um, engaged Ernst Young to to do an additional financial analysis on uh, on this particular change. Can you go a little bit into um, the details of, of uh, the outcome of that analysis? I know um, you said it was, um, but just a little bit more in, into the detail, into the methodology, right? That we use to be able to kind of um, you know to make this recommendation uh, for this vote today. Sure, I think I'll defer again to Devin for the specifics of the Ernst and Young report, though. Okay. Thanks, Casey. So uh, I think, as Casey mentioned in the, in the earlier part of the uh, presentation, it was very important to us that as we were entertaining these changes to make sure that they were uh, necessary in the market and that they weren't, they were, they were the changes that were, were absolutely required to move the project forward. So uh, we engaged Ernst & Young. Ernst & Young was the uh, original outside consultant we, the BPDA hired in order to evaluate all the proposals that came in for the Winthrop Square garage development. So they were already familiar with the project. So we continued that relationship and, and they uh, engaged in an effort that they worked closely with the Millennium team to understand their financial picture uh, and what the, what the um, oh, what has happened in the market. And then they went out and, and talked to many participants. They talked to several banks, they talked to several developers, both locally and nationally, talked to brokers, talked to tenants. So they did a very comprehensive research relying on, you know, for one of the, the, the strongest evaluative firms uh, out there in the, in the marketplace. And they came back with a very clear message that, that yes, the, uh, the reduction in the size of the project is absolutely necessary. It's, it's, a, it's a cost of reduction. Uh, that's necessary due to COVID, if you heard um, Kathy and, and Joe speak to, but also very importantly and, and key to our, our um, uh, evaluation here, the move to rental housing was absolutely required as well. There, there are not, uh, from Ernst & Young's perspective, uh, lenders that are currently making uh, loans on high-end luxury condos in, in uh, as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, that is not a financing source that is readily available. So uh, they recommend, they, they endorsed both of those changes as, as uh, evidence, as, mar as market-based and necessary to move the project forward. Okay, thank you. Uh, any additional questions from the board? Um, um, go on. One. This is Brian and, and this is to Joe. Forgive me, uh, Joe, because I'm fairly new to the board, but. When I look at the, the drop in the commitment for the affordable housing from 48 million to 22 million, you know, that, that's a significant reduction for the city. And I know that falls out of changing from condominiums to rental. Could you give me some perspective on where the condominium market was when you were putting the plan together or maybe a, a year ago versus where it is now? And then also without a lot of detail, where the rental market is so was the rental market held and the, the condo market dropped significantly your perspective on that would help me yeah thank you so um 
when we uh, planned for this project and when we uh, we fully ex we expected uh, to be a, a general continuation of the sick of the of the um, desirability of downtown Boston to be a um, to be a place for for home ownership uh, we've done in this neighborhood here about a thousand units um, over the last 12 years the most recent are over at Millennium Tower that we completed a little while ago um, there's been some ebbs and flows we don't ever you know in that rent in that for sale market um, but we basically believe in sort of the fundamental belief that that market will we, um, will, will continue. So we never really try to time things. Um, and I think that that's how we looked at it a while ago and that's how we continue to look at it. Um, and I think that's how we look at it in the future. And I think uh, uh, we don't believe um, that, the, that the condominium market uh, uh, will stay away from the downtown Boston marketplace. Um, our lenders, by the way, believe that that's how they have to look at it. Um, that's the primary source of us, our belief of, of, of the, the level of equity that we're putting in. Um, so I would say that the velocity of, of right, uh, right now is pretty slow for the sale of condominiums. In fact, it's almost not existence right now. Uh, we do expect that, it'll, that, that it will pick up. On the rental market side of things, to your, to your point, um, I think it's, this, it's, a, it's a customer that, that wants to be, um, is a little more flexible Right, and they don't want to be committed to one particular place for sort of an extended period of time that's related to a for, for sale. Um, I believe there's been a bit of a deterioration in the in the rental market in the form of higher vacancies. Um, but I, I still believe that you know by all standards on the market rate side of things, um, the the um, the level of revenue that could come from a a market rate. Um, rental housing project um, will adequately satisfy the lending requirements okay that, that we have um, I expect we expect that um, that when people come back into downtown um, either as a renter you know either you know as and and we start sort of reopening ourselves here a little bit we really do believe that um, this condition that Boston is facing or the downtown is facing I think is really is temporary we're long into uh, downtown. We've we've been through a few different things. This is the worst, by the way. Um, but we do believe ultimately, but that by the time this building is finished, okay, um, once we start, okay, by the time this, this building is finished at the end of 22, um, uh, we think that uh, Boston will be will, if not back the way the way we might have imagined it to be, um, a really desirable place to be. Um, and 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 we and and that's what we're counting on, um, and our commitment, our financial commitment, plus the underlying uh, the underlying stability of the of a rental program, is what is our is our is our um, commitment to is is, our, is 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 justifying what we say is our support for for why this pro why we we think we can get this project done um and the, and we are talking to some lending sources right now and it's uh, it, and more than talking we're having some very substantive conversations um and we're cautiously optimistic that we're going to be successful here um across the board i think the nice thing that happens is when that commitment changes and we're able to change if we're able to change from rental to condominium, uh, then the commitment to the affordable housing will just go right back up. Sure. Okay. So that's what that's what we're shooting for. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Um, given the uh, uncertainties in uh, capital markets at this point, um, how how long? Uh, do these lenders give you essentially to demonstrate that uh, this change, assuming we were to approve it, um, would uh, permit you to move forward as you're trying to move forward without their coming back to you and saying, oh, oh we want to see some additional kind, kind of change? Yeah, so um, um, there's very fulsome conversations um, Doctor, um, that we're having right now. There's these are these are deep and in detailed in all kinds of matters that we're facing. These are this these are sort of um, and um, all the hypotheticals that you can imagine um, and that we're imagining and they're imagining are being worked through right now across the board. Um, and so and it's those things 
it's the culmination of, of those things that's given us the confidence to believe that we will get to that closing relatively soon. And I think relatively soon in the next 60 days. Um, um, so I think that's, that's kind of the time frame we're in. We have, we have a meeting of the minds on many different things here like this. Um, uh, I can tell you that um, the BPDA has, um, has appropriately made sure that this is, that we have to stay in touch with them. And um, the, the kind of commitments and changes we're talking about making here um, are not permanent if we don't start. Okay, we have to start or, or, or the, you, the BPDA and you guys in the city will say, okay, that didn't work, let's go again. But that said, uh, we wouldn't be asking, we wouldn't be here in front of you um, and we wouldn't, uh, w without a strong belief here that, that we're going to be successful here. Uh, just from a uh, design point of view, the renderings uh, seem to indicate pretty clearly uh, that the elimination of this 90,000 square foot tower um, is not going to have any kind of impact on uh, shadows on uh, the uh, uh, west side of the building, basically. That's it, correct. That's yeah, correct. I mean, yeah. it, it seems pretty obvious, but someone might ask at some point. Yeah. Yes, and that did come up at the IAG meeting and we walked people through. Okay. Uh, and, and then finally, I would just say uh, uh, thank you for your continuing commitment. I mean, I know these markets have been wild um, and, and not wild necessarily in a positive way over the last few months. Um, and I think we have a pretty good sense of what you're trying to accomplish here. Um, and to do that while maintaining the rest of uh, the commitments that you've made, I think is, is very important and it, and it sends a message to other people because I do have a feeling that uh, we may be hearing from some other developers um, who may be facing some of the same challenges at this moment. And it's important uh, for us to know that you've been able to maintain the, the uh, community benefit uh, commitments to the extent uh, possible. Thank you. It's a, it's a priority. It's a priority that you, you charged us with when you voted us the first time around. So um, we don't think of it as anything other than what we have to do and want to do, quite frankly. Thank you. I have a question. I, I, it's my understanding that the condominium market was maybe about a third international buyers. It, do you see the residential market as also international or is it a more of a local, local market for your units? Um, yeah, so, you know, we can we can have a conversation about the, your premise of about a third or not a third, and I think that's that's fair. It's a fair conversation to have. I would say um, the the mix of rent of uh, residents, whether they're owners or or renters or just people, um, the investor market is is generally pretty small in Boston. It's just kind of small. At least that's been our experience. I mean, there have been some. Um, it's it's more of a lifestyle thing. It's more of the idea of whether they want it sink roots or whether people would like to um, um, to sort of be a little bit more temporary in their commitments, both their financial commitments and where they live, like that. Thank you. Thank you. Any additional questions from the board? I have a couple of questions from Solar and it's whether Joe or Kathy and then the other one would be to Devin. The 90 square, f the 90,000 square foot, was that a separate tower or was that on top of an uh, Part of, part of the um, yeah. that that is supported by the same foundation system so it, it was on top of the office portion um as i mentioned that structural slab that is at the top of the office that has been eliminated but the foundations are in and they were designed to support that tower so that that money sunk so the footprint is still the same it was this was just going to be on top of a building so with that cap gone you couldn't add on to it in the future i guess um it'd be very difficult because part of our cost savings is to reduce the mechanical systems that supported that tower yeah because they were somewhat independent so uh, i wouldn't say impossible but that's not contemplated and would be very difficult oh um, mike i think you're on mute i think you're on yeah 
I don't know how I put myself on you, no? but um, anyway, so the other question is to Devin, and um, what wasn't said was the, the prior commitments, I think are all in place, and if they are, it should be said, um, on the, uh, the, to the parks, the common, I think was 28 million, Franklin Park was 28 million, the Emerald Necklace, 11 million, Rose Kennedy Greenway was 5 million, um, and the BHA commitments to Orion Heights and East Boston, 10 million, and Old Colony in South Boston was 25 million. That's all, that's all still in place, and it's really just the delta of the $26 million that has split away due to rentals versus sales on the affordable housing piece at, uh, on Tremont Street, correct? Yeah, thank you for raising that. Um, you're absolutely correct. So I think it's important to affirmatively say that the original sales price for the property was a total of 151 million that the city will uh, still, in, given these changes, still receive 151 million, that that deal is still 100% in place. Uh, and, and in addition, as is mentioned several times in the meeting, that the affordable housing commitments there, well, the initial change to rental has reduced under the IDP policy, the rental contribution is less. Um, the, you've heard very clearly from the Millennium team that they intend to uh, switch to condos in the future if they can. And uh, and if they do, it, it would be a full $48 million affordable housing commitment that was part of the original approval will be met. Yeah, and I, I think it's important to point out Millennium is living up to everything that they have to under the rules, so to speak, and, and then some. So they're, they're victims in this in some ways too, as the affordable housing is. But thank you, uh, Kathy and Devin. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, any further questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, we'll take a roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Uh, Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, item number 21. Request authorization to issue a certificate of completion pursuant to the land disposition agreement with the South End, with the United, with the, sorry, with United South End Settlements for parcel 17, located at 566 Columbus Avenue in the South End Urban Renewal Area. Michael. Um, thank you. Good afternoon, Madam Chair, members of the board, Madam Secretary, and Director Golden. Um, my name is Michael Sinatra. I'm a project manager with BPDA Development Review. We are here before you this evening seeking a certificate of completion for the building located at 566 Columbus Avenue. Um, you might recall that this site is in the process of being sold and the new proposed project was approved by this body at the December 2019 board meeting. The current building that is being sold is owned by United South End Settlements, which was conveyed the property, also known as Parcel 17 in the South End Urban Renewal Plan area on November 6, 1974 and had their land disposition agreement executed on March 7th, 1974. After reviewing their paperwork in preparation for the purchase and sale with the new proponent, New Boston Ventures, it was discovered that a certificate of completion was never issued for the existing building. This certificate is necessary in order for the transaction to close at the end of July, so we are here before you this evening to ask for your vote to approve and issue this outstanding certificate. We do also have some members of the development team present, so we would be happy to take any questions that you may have. Thank you. Do we have any questions from the board? Maybe this isn't entirely fair, but given that the building was completed and has been in use since 1974, and we're finally issuing this uh, certificate of, of completion, what does that mean for what the legal status for the use has, has been for more than 30 years? I mean, I can't imagine this happens very often, but what does that mean? Um, it's a good question. Uh, it doesn't happen often. It's not a question that I, don't, I think I'm prepared to answer. Uh, maybe someone from the team could probably answer that question. Um, you know, how do I? Uh, 
How do I? Oh, you oh. Hi, it's Renee Lefebvre. Um, could you please state the question? I think I would be able to answer it. Well, the building was physically completed and, and put into service sometime around 1974. Uh, but for whatever reason, a certificate, a certificate of completion apparently uh, wasn't approved or issued. So I'm just curious, I, again, I can't imagine this happens often. Um, what was the legal status of the building and its use for all of those decades if we're only approving the certificate of completion now? Oh, okay, thank you. Thank you for repeating the question. So the certificate of completion is certifying under the land disposition agreement that was entered in 1974 that the project is completed pursuant to the provisions of the land disposition agreement, the um, design plans, the final working drawings and specifications that were approved at that time. And separately, um, the inspectional service department issued um, an occupancy permit. So this, so it had legal, it had a legal occupancy permit by the city through ISD, and this certificate of completion is really just um, pursuant to a separate legal agreement, the land disposition agreement. Okay. And so, it the reason why it was never issued is because um, they're issued by the BPDA today, and um, you know throughout all our LDAs when the developer comes back and requests it of us. And then there's a process. It's very similar to when we issue certificates of completion under cooperation agreements, where our um, architects go out, the project managers go out, they view the building to make sure that, in fact, it has been built um, in compliance with um, our agreements. That's fine, thank you. So what you're saying, there's a difference, I just want to make sure I understand, there's a difference between the, if it's pursuant to an LDA, a land disposition agreement versus a cooperation agreement, which are the ones that we typically see. Yes, and yes, that is correct, um, Madam Chair, and there is also a difference between these certificates of completions under these separate agreements versus an, um, a certificate of occupancy by the special service department. Okay. Um, interesting. Um, all right. Any additional questions? I guess it just begs the question a little bit of, are there any, would there, is there a risk that there's any other ones out there or do we at least have proper controls in place now to um, kind of catch some of this thing maybe that we did in 1974? <laughs> so there are a handful out there. We find them throughout you know, when um, when projects come up um, and they have changes, they refinance, we were able to find them through basically title searches because our land disposition agreements, for the most part, most of them are um, recorded. And so when a new project comes along, like this one, we have a proposed project, the parties are going to um, transfer and um, through the due diligence, uh, they found that there was never a certificate of completion issued back in 1975. And that's why they need it today to, to clear the title, to finance the new project, and to transfer. Um, and so we are, you know, that is sort of the mechanism for how we're able to track and find them. And in many instances, um, the staff will be able to go back if, if um, a request for a certificate of completion comes in for an older project with an older LDA, uh, many times um, staff is able to find the vote that was taken back at that time, and for some reason the certificate of completion might have been lost, it might not have ever been issued but was authorized, or um, it was recorded in a way that it's hard to find, it wasn't properly matched up with the project, and so we are able to um, process those ones as well. All right, thank you. Um, any further questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. So moved. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Ronahan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. 
And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Um, okay, item number 22, request authorization to co-petition the Public Improvement Commission to lay out a highway easement over Zero Tremont Avenue in Roxbury in connection with the improvements that are part of the Boston Public Works Department Ruggles Street Reconstruction Project. Morgan. Thank you, Madam Chair. The BPDA owns a parcel known as Zero Tremont Street that is approximately 51,000 square feet directly south of the Ruggles MBTA station. The parcel includes paved roadways and a small plaza. Maintenance for this parcel is currently performed by Northeastern University. The City of Boston Public Works Department is in the design process for the reconstruction of Ruggles Street between Washington Street and Columbus Avenue. Key elements of this project include traffic calming, enhanced pedestrian accommodations, and two-way bicycle accommodations. The Public Works Department is proposing bicycle accommodations and other physical improvements on the BPDA parcel in order to make the connection from the intersection of Ruggles Street at Tremont Street to Ruggles Station and the Southwest Corridor bike path. The roadways on the BPDA parcel currently serve as traveled ways. Therefore, in order to make the proposed improvements on the parcel, we are requesting board approval to co-petition the Public Improvement Commission for the layout of a highway easement over the parcel to formalize it as a public way. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Very much, Morgan. Any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. I have to recuse myself from this because I didn't appreciate that this involved Northeastern. Um, so I'm recusing myself from uh, voting on this. Seconded. Okay, uh, roll call for a vote. Uh, Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Uh, Mr. Miller? Aye. Um, and the chair votes aye. A uh, motion passes with Dr. Landsmark recusal. Okay, thank you. Item number 23, request authorization to disperse $100,000 from the South Boston Waterfront Civic Cultural Space build out chapter 91 funds to Grub Street Inc. to build a narrative art center at 50 Liberty on Fan Pier and to enter into a grant agreement with Grub Street Inc. Richard. Great. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair, members of the board, Director Gold, and Secretary Kalimas. Uh, my name is Richard McGinnis. I'm Deputy Director for Waterfront Planning and uh, Climate and Environmental Planning. Um, in 2018, the City of Boston selected Grub Street to be the use of program for a 13,000 square foot facility on Fan Pier on the South Boston Waterfront. The space is mitigation derived through the South Boston Waterfront Municipal Harbor Plan, Article 80 process, and the Chapter 91 approval process. Uh, their selection followed a well-received public process to solicit interest and ideas from across the city. The space is located at a prominent parcel on Fan Pier along Harbor Walk and the expansive open space. It affords views to the inner and outer harbor and its neighbors uh, with the ICA. Uh, the building is 50 Liberty. If you look at the image on the left, it's um, the building um, in the top center uh, right along the cove. Uh, and then that aerial image on the right, that building under construction on the lower right, uh, that's 50 Liberty. So this facility will be located in uh, the first two floors of this new building. Uh, next slide. Uh, Grub Street will expand the development narrative arts center, including a bookstore, cafe, podcast studio, classrooms and events, performance space for readings and storytelling events. Uh, they're partnering with Mass Poetry and uh, Porter Square Books. Uh, they will continue their successful programs, including the Young Adult Writers Program for high school students in the Boston area. Grub Street's core programming and continued work with communities of color, including the Boston Writers of Color group and immigrant organizations will help move the South Boston waterfront to an equitable and inclusive waterfront for all, deliberately welcoming, accessible, and interesting. After their selection in 2018, Grub Street continued to final design when they determined project shortfall due to the need for upgrades to the mechanicals, uh, the soundproofing, and the building flooring. Uh, additional funds through the Calderwood uh, Charitable Foundation, the Fallon Company, and our grant will allow them to continue with construction. They're actually under construction at the moment, um, and they anticipate completion by late uh, fall of this year. 
Uh, that concludes my presentation. Thank you. Sorry, I couldn't find my mute button. Okay, so thank you, Richard. Do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye, motion passes, thank you. Thank you. That's exciting. I like that one. Item number 24, uh, request authorization to distribute $100,000 from the Fenway Park Demonstration Project Community Benefits Fund to 10 community organizations and to enter into grant agreements with the community organizations. Sona. Good evening, Madam Chair, members of the board. Director Golden, Madam Secretary, I'm here to request authorization to disperse $100,000 from the Fenway Park Demonstration Project Community Benefits Fund to 10 community organizations in the Fenway neighborhood. This is the sixth round of funds being disbursed. The applications for these funds were initially due on April 7th, but due to COVID-19, we, we extended the due date for this round of funds, and this was extended to June 16th. Uh, we received 13 applications for this round, and today we're requesting to enter into grant agreements with 10 of the applications and um, the details of those applicants are in your board memo. But I'm happy to answer any questions. Great, thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay, hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. I'll move. Second. Okay, roll call for a vote, Ms. Downs. Aye. Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. Thank you, Simone. Item number 25, personnel. Uh, welcome back, David. Um, thank you again, Madam Chair, members of the board, uh, Madam Secretary and Director Golden. We have three items for your consideration on the BRA agenda today. Um, we have three status changes um, with the details that are in your board memos. Michelle Goldberg, Budget Director in the Budget and Finance Department, Jill Ox Zick, the Landscape Architect in the Planning Department, and John Campbell, the Project Manager in the Development and Review Department. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, do we have any questions from the board? Okay. Hearing and seeing none, a motion is in order. Second. Okay. Roll call for a vote. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monahan? Aye. Uh, Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller? Aye. And the chair votes aye. Motion passes. And congratulations to all those promotions. It's exciting. Item number 26, contractual. I need a motion to pay the bills. I move that we pay our bills. Second. Okay, let's vote on that. All right. Ms. Downs? Aye. Mr. Monaghan? Aye. Dr. Landsmark? Aye. Mr. Miller. Aye. Uh, and chair votes aye. Motion passes. Pay the bills, please. Um, director's update. Director Golden, you're on mute. Uh, the video is not on, but there you go. There you go. There you go. Got it. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, Madam Chair, and through our good evening, at this rate, uh, and through you to the members, uh, I want to thank you, first of all, for your vote this evening to extend the BPDA's rent deferment program uh, for our tenants who, who uh, provide jobs and economic activity at BPDA-owned property. Uh, the BPDA launched the rent deferment program back in April as a way to support the small and large businesses uh, that uh, uh, lease our properties and that have been uh, significantly impacted by COVID-19. Uh, the agency has received rent deferral requests from tenants representing almost every category of commercial real estate um, in the BPDA's portfolio. These include hospitality, retail, office, 
industrial. Uh, your vote today extends this rent deferment program that has been in place for three months through September for qualified commercial tenants at our facilities. And in this vote, will continue to provide meaningful help and support to our tenants so that they emerge from the pandemic intact, healthy, and capable of contributing uh, to Boston's economic vitality. So thank you for that. Earlier this week, Mayor Walsh made multiple exciting announcements uh, with regard to uh, job training and summer jobs uh, that are operated um, through the assistance of our own Office of Workforce Development, OWD. In particular, I want to call attention to an innovative approach to summer employment. The mayor announced a new feature of the city's summer jobs program uh, with OWD's new Learn and Earn Career Development Internship. This, this internship program pays young people to take college level courses. Uh, for high school students, this coursework can be a gateway to college. Uh, for current college students, uh, they can use this program to advance their progress toward a degree. The city's also providing all summer job participants with a resource guide to workers' rights. It was put together by uh, the Office of Attorney General Laura Healy. And this guide will hopefully um, enable young people to enter the workforce uh, knowing and understanding their rights as employees. So once again, thank you to all our team at the Office of Workforce Development for their hard work in ensuring that the city summer jobs program has a lasting impact on the lives of Boston's uh, young residents. Finally tonight, I want to say farewell to our senior project manager, Tim Cherwinski. Uh, Tim has accepted a new role as director of planning at um, the, the director, he, he'll be the director of planning and economic development with the town of Milton. Uh, we're going to miss Tim a lot. Uh, Tim is hardworking, he's smart, he's principled. Uh, he is uh, very, very intelligent, very funny. His presence on the ninth floor and out in the communities will by, be missed by those who work with him, both in City Hall and in the neighborhoods. We will especially miss uh, Tim's stylish bow ties when he appears before you. You may have noticed he is most frequently, if not always, uh, be decked with a bow tie. And if you saw him strolling down the street, he would almost certainly have a fedora perched on his head and um, in really bright colored patterned socks. So Tim is hard to miss. He is a pure joy to work with. He'll always have a whole bunch of friends uh, here at the Boston Planning and Development Agency. We'll miss him, and I thank Tim on behalf of all of us at the BPDA for his dedicated work in making Boston a better place for all its residents. So Godspeed, Tim Chawinski, and thank you. With that, I wish you a good night, and I look forward to seeing you all in August. Good evening. Thank you. Thank you, Director Golden, and uh, congratulations, Tim. Um, we will be missed, but we're excited for you. So um, with that, I need a motion to adjourn the meeting. That's so oh, moved. OK. Um, we can adjourn our meeting. All right. <laughs> Second. OK, yeah. OK, roll call for a vote. Uh, Ms. Downs. Aye. Okay, Mr. Monahan. Aye. Dr. Landsmark. Aye. Mr. Miller. 
Aye. And the chair votes aye. Meeting adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Stay healthy, stay safe. Um, cheers. Thanks. Have a great night.